Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to go over an exchange that's rather confusing and frustrating between Craig from Fight the Flat Earth and a prominent flat earther. Now I picked this particular exchange because Craig actually has a degree in physics and the person that he's debating, if you want to call it that, is basically a minivan driver that makes up for his lack of scientific knowledge with just being stubborn. Probably the most difficult part of dealing with these debates is that we on the science side have to actually try and teach our opponents some basic scientific principles in order to have any sort of intelligent conversation with them. The problem is, is that we are dealing with a narrative and no amount of education or information will change their narrative. In this exchange, we're going to see some very basic misunderstandings of scientific principles. We're also going to see the misuse of logical fallacies and the cherry picking of scientific papers that seem to support uh, an idea in this narrative, but really don't. Yet no amount of explanation will convince the person making those assertions that they're doing them wrong. Now being slightly brain damaged from doing a 14 part series on another flat earther, we're going to have to make this one a little fun. So unless you are over the age of 21 or whatever the legal drinking age is for your state or country, and you are at home for the evening, I would ask that you not view this video. When you do meet those conditions and you're ready for a good time, I want you to take a drink every time you hear the term breaking the wand. Now the maximum limit on that is going to have to be about 10. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now another reason that I chose this particular episode is both participants seemed to be relatively civil until they got to the end. Craig is a former submariner with a degree in physics. Anthony is a small businessman with aspirations for the legal profession. Hello, and we should be live. Um, can everyone in my stream please let me know if they can hear me and if they can hear Sleeping Warrior? All right, my intro is finished there. Are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Are we good to go? We should be, yes. Let, right. Let's dispense with the formalities. We both know which we each we are. I yep. am Sleeping Warrior, and my opponent for tonight is Fight the Flat Earth. Excellent. Right, let's, let's get on with the show. What shape is the Earth, sir? The Earth is an oblate spheroid with a circumference of approximately 25,000 miles or 40,000 kilometers. Right. Any evidence to prove that that's true? There is much evidence. Um, the question is, what evidence will you accept? Will you accept images and videos? Will you accept um, third party accounts? Because obviously I can refer to every image and video that's ever been taken from space to show that we live on a globe that says that it is what it is. Um, I will I will accept any evidence that, that does not satisfy the definition for pseudoscience. On screen for my audience, I've got a definition that's just literally, if you type in pseudoscience definition in Google, the top result just defines it as a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on scientific method. So We're getting off to a good start with the first trap that Anthony is laying, and that is this pseudoscience definition. Now, according to the Flat Earth, the scientific method is a very specific and restrictive method. They do not acknowledge the multiple definitions of scientific method, nor the multiple variations on scientific method. Now, most of their contention with the scientific method depends on this particular definition of what an experiment is. Note that it says that there is an independent variable and a dependent variable, and that the independent variable must be manipulated by the scientist. Now please note in the very next entry, when you do a Google search for the three components of a scientific experiment, it says manipulation of the independent variable and its effect on the dependent variable. 
It does not say that the scientist must personally manipulate that variable. Now this extremely narrow definition is key to the flat earth narrative. By saying that the investigator must personally manipulate the independent variable, they rule out geology, seismology, astronomy, theoretical physics, etc. as not being true science based on their definition of the scientific method. The reason for this being, of course, that the investigator is not personally determining the location of earthquakes or moving planets. They are merely relying on effects on the dependent variable when nature manipulates the independent variable. So if we can get it outside of that definition so that it becomes science, then I'll accept it, or at least consider it as credible. If it falls into that definition of uh, pseudoscience, unfortunately, I'll dismiss it and I'll do it to your face. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll probably disagree with you on what you consider pseudoscience, because I'm pretty sure we will have a disagreement on what the scientific method is. All right. So do, do we agree that there is a difference between theoretical physics and experiment-based science? Yes. Um, would, what, what would you say the difference between the two is? Well, theoretical physics is obviously much more based around um, mathematical deriv deriv derivations of, of theories. Um, whereas, you know, experimental physics and, you know, actual physics will be things that you can physically do experiments on, like um, testing the acceleration of gravity and things like that. That's not theoretical. We know that we can measure the, the, the acceleration that we experience on the planet. So um, theoretical sciences would be Things like talking about dark matter, um, dark energy, black holes, you know, because we have okay. to look at the maths that we understand to kind of understand that. But things what, like what, measuring you... gravity and things like that, I would say, would, would be physical experiments. Well, measuring something that's not technically an experiment is part of the process, but it's not. Part of the it's process, not, right. yeah. So, so my question is, what weight should we give evidentially to theoretical physics? Um... Is it strong evidence? Is it 50-50 or is it weak and should be dismissed? Oh, no, it definitely shouldn't be dismissed because theoretical physics is um, an extension of our understandings. I mean, when, when you look at science, obviously, we don't have all of the answers. We, we have the best explanations that we're able to get from looking at our observations and, you know, doing the maths to, to figure out if things fall into place. And I think that it's important to note here that the definition of an experiment that Anthony uses does include the term inference. A good analogy would be saying experimental physics is something that we can test, and it, based on the results of those tests, theoretical physics tells us what we think this may mean in the long term or as an extension. And I know that a lot of theoretical physics has um, a lot of questions around it as to whether it's valid, whether the, the theories are correct. Um, you know, you go right down to the the, the you know the very base of of like physics with um looking at quantum loop gravity or string theory you know we know that there's energy base there but we don't really know exactly what it is so we have to use a mathematical model to try and describe it as best as we can and i don't think you should ever dismiss a mathematical model until it's been thoroughly disproven well why would you rely on a mathematical model given that it's mathematical by nature because the a model is um, a way of describing your reality and the way that you see if a model is correct is by using the model to make predictions and if the predictions work then you say the model's correct and that's what you would go with until a better model comes along that not only explains things as well but explains them better and so far I don't think there's well I, I could say conclusively there isn't anything that explains things better than the current understandings we have. Would you say that a mathematical model is conceptual? It's not physical, it's not tangible, it's not practical, it's not scientific in that you're not able to do anything with it other than calculate mathematically? Notice that Anthony's not attacking a particular mathematical model on any sort of a mathematical or scientific basis. What he's attempting to do is undermine the credibility of any mathematical model. 
this is for no reason other than to give him the opportunity to simply hand wave the model away as not being a real thing at a later time when it's convenient to him. Notice that he completely glosses over the testability of mathematical models. Um, at points, um, I, I will say that you know there is things about math, math model, mathematical models that are they, they have to be conceptual. They have to be um, you know a, a derivation of the physics that we understand. But there is parts of the model that you can test, um, and when there's parts of the model that you can test that work, and the rest of the maths fits in with that then I would say that it has all been, you know, figured out to, to work and be correct. So if you're going to use something that's conceptual by nature, it lacks tangibility. It's not something that's like you, you can't manipulate it. You can't throw it. You can't touch it. You can't do anything with it because it's mathematical by nature. Why would you treat that as though it's real in the, se in the sense that you're going to base your perception of our cosmology on it when it's based on maths? It's not based on the real world. Because maths is the world. Maths describes the universe. Maths um, is a universal language that everybody um, can can use to understand the same things. Maths isn't reality. Oh, you I would one hundred percent disagree with that. Uh, that maths isn't reality because everything can be described with maths. Absolutely, yeah, described. Everything. Yeah, so I agree. Everything in, can be in described. that in that basis of the fact that everything can be described with maths. Then maths is reality because it's an a description of reality in a language that everybody can have a basis of that is the same. Okay. okay, so in the preliminary parts of this interview, or debate if you want to call it, Anthony Riley scored a couple of good points. First of all, he has put out this definition of pseudoscience based on an unspoken scientific method, which he will spring later. The second thing is he's called into question the validity of mathematical models as not being reality. Now we're going to get into the meat of this discussion, which is gravity. Now, as you recall from the introduction, we have a special phrase tonight. It's the $64 question, so to say. Now, what I would like to do is let him use it once and then let me sit down and explain it as to how he's misusing it. Then we'll see how many times he continues to use it. Okay, so on a video that I presented uh, on my channel on the 6th of Feb, if you haven't seen it, it's called The Science the Science of Deception Featuring Gravity Rammed Down Our Throat. It was aimed at yourself, and in that video, uh, you did respond to it. You made some uh, really bold assertions, and I, I addressed them with um, reference to a particular uh, citation from Scientific American. Yes. And you did you did do a response video, and one of the things that you said, it, well, you said numerous things in the video, but one specific thing that you said in the response video on your channel was that I shouldn't use this uh, Scientific American document to prove anything. And yeah, I didn't use I, I stand by that because it's... Yeah, I, it's, hang on, it's, hang on, hang on. Sorry. Hang on. Sorry. I didn't use it to prove anything other than what the current science is, which is why I want to now reassert this point, because I'm not using it to prove a prove something. All, all I'm asking is at this point with regards to gravity, because I've heard you say a lot of stuff to do with gravity, mm -hmm. how it's a, how it's a repeatable, uh, verifiable um, thing. Um, but I want to know what is your understanding of gravity per science as it stands today? OK, so the way that I describe gravity um, so that people can understand it uh, using all the physics that we understand is that Gravity is a warping of space-time that can change the locality of things that within Newtonian physics manifests as an accelerating force. Now, before we get into this long discussion of gravity, I think that we should probably discuss the difference between Newtonian, Einsteinian gravity. Science has understood that masses attracted other masses for centuries. Newton described that attraction as a force that was proportionate to the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. This described the magnitude or the action of the force. Einstein in his general theory of relativity in 1905 described the cause of gravity. Whereas Newton didn't understand the cause of gravity and just considered it an intrinsic property of matter and instantaneous in its action, Einstein declared it to be a warping of space-time, and its effect traveled at the speed of light. 
if you were to visualize the solar system with the planets orbiting around the Sun. If the Sun would suddenly disappear along with its mass, under Newtonian gravity the planets would immediately continue in a straight line in whatever direction that they were going at that moment and go off into space. Under Einstein, if the Sun would suddenly disappear, it would take some eight minutes for the Earth to go dark because the light would still be traveling for that eight minutes due to the distance. Gravity would continue to travel with the light. So, for the first eight minutes after the Sun disappeared, we would continue to orbit around where the Sun used to be. And then as the Earth went dark and the gravity stopped, we would then go off into the, in straight lines as Newtonian gravity would dictate we do. Now in most applications in the universe we can describe gravity as a force under Newtonian gravity. The actual nuts and bolts of the cause of gravity is best described by Einstein. They are both very good descriptions of the same process. Newton describes the action of gravity and Einstein describes the cause of gravity. In essence, they are two wings of the same bird. Right. So what you're saying is, it just how does it interact with Newtonian principles? Does it? You said that. Does it add to it? Does it refine it? Does it? Does well, it... the way that you you have to look at it, Newton um, in the video that you showed me, uh, well, where, where Brian Cox described the whole thing of the apple falling on Newton's head. I mean, that didn't actually happen, but but by the by. Um, Newton saw gravity as an invisible force, right? He didn't really know what gravity was at all. What Newton did was come up with the universal law of gravitational attraction, which is the F equals gm1 m2 over r squared, which can accurately predict the, the way that things fall uh, and the way that things move in the universe that we observe. Now, ag again, he, he assumed or he just thought it was an invisible force, whereas Einstein came along and said, well, no, it's not a force. It's a literal warping of space-time, which, like I said, changes the locality of things. Um, but within Newtonian physics, it manifests as a force. And we, we can say that because it, it, there's an acceleration when things fall. And we know that acceleration requires a force. So there was a lot of things about gravity that Newton got very wrong. Uh, I mean, you know, he lived a long, long time ago and didn't have a lot of the understandings that we have. But his observations were, uh, and, and his mathematical law was based on, you know, physical measurements of things fall, uh, falling, and not just falling, but accelerating at 9.8 metres per second squared. Okay, so just clarify. Um, the question was, how does Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity interact did one add to the other, refine it, or did one um, replace the other so that one becomes obsolete and antiquated and the other one replaces it? What was the interaction? It was um, an explanation, uh, a, a furthering of the understanding. It, it didn't replace it. it. It didn't say that, no, that's not what it is and that's completely wrong. But it, it took the... You could say that New Newtonian uh, gravity is the what and Einsteinian gravity is the why. They, the, right, two, I, the two I, are intrinsically linked. You know, they are, you, they're not like, you know, separate things, separate, completely separate entities. They describe the same thing happening, but um, Einstein gave us a lot of more explanations as to why these forces and these attractive um, accelerations happen. Okay, I'll credit you with a correct recite for what you actually said. What you've said now compared to what you said in the video are the same. However, what you've said now and what you said in the video are incorrect. Um, what the current position by science is that, and I'm reading from that document that you ignored in the response video, um, relativity snapped the wand in two by showing that the curvature of space-time, and specifically not an invisible force, gives rise to gravitational attraction. Okay, let's make sure that we thoroughly understand what is meant by snapping the wand. Under Newton, Gravity was considered an intrinsic property of matter, and it acted as an invisible force over a distance instantaneously, almost like magic. Then Newton came along and gave gravity an actual cause and a speed over distance. He took the magical properties of how gravity worked away by explaining them. 
hence the snapping of the wand. Now the action of gravity still occurred. We could still measure it like a force, but Einstein took the magic out of it and explained how and why it happened. Einstein did not disprove the equations that Newton came up with. He added to them. Those equations that Newton came up with work just as well now as they did before 1905. Newton's laws of motion, his equation that determines that force equals mass times acceleration, and the universal law of gravity are continued to be used on a daily basis in everyday life. And in fact, the Scientific American article that he is citing First, is not a research paper, it's an editorial, which means that it is an opinion piece. And second, if you read further down, it says that. There is absolutely nothing in that opinion piece that even remotely suggests that it is a this or that. Einsteinian gravity does not invalidate Newtonian gravity, nor does the Scientific America article suggests that. This is a single line in that article that is used to illustrate another point that Anthony is seizing upon because somehow he gives him the ability to try and play one off of the other. This is not being used to try and disprove gravity or one type of gravity. It is being used to try and distract and confuse the actual point that they are both complementary and, as I said, two wings of the same bird. But yeah. we have a problem. We have a problem. Because if we're going to go with the bending of space-time, bearing in mind that we've just spoke about um, like concepts, mathematical concepts, and whether they're reality or not, yeah. if I now type in space-time in um, Google and look up the definition for space-time, it's defined as by Wikipedia. It says, in physics, space-time is any mathematical model that fuses the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time into a single four-dimensional continuum. But the problem is the definition of reification fallacy is treating something that is conceptual as reality. So on the one hand, we've got relativity that snaps the wand of, uh, of Newtonian principles of gravity in, in two. In other words, it's antiquated science now. It's not a refining of. It replaced it completely. That's out the window. But it's replaced it with a mathematical construct. And the mathematical construct, by definition, with it being maths, is a reification because it's it's literally conceptualizing something that's mathematical rather than proving it uh, experimentally, which See, takes I'm, me back. I'm going to have on, to disagree on. with you about just, the fact hang on, that just, it, not, Bear with sorry, me. Sorry, I'm I, quite I, I apologize. Point. Carry on which takes me back to my original point, to what value should we give something that's theoretical by nature? Because the maths, um, uh, I didn't realise I wasn't presenting that all that presentation then, um, the maths that's presented by Einstein is theoretical physics because it's not capable of any um, experimental testing because its construct is mathematical by nature. So my question is, if Einstein replaced Newton, but Einstein is purely mathematical, if it's got no application experimentally, what is the value of this theoretical physics that Einstein presents that's mathematical in pr improving gravity as, a, as a anything? How, how are we going to prove it if it's purely mathematical? See, again, I would have to disagree that we have discarded Newtonian gravity because that's not the case. We use the you know Newtonian uh, law of gravitational attraction and the equations around that to figure out how to send men to the moon. You know, so th those those equations that that Newton came up with to describe the attractive force are still as relevant now as they ever were. What Einstein did was try and describe why that force is happening. I mean, when you get into higher end physics, it's not even really a force. It's much more to do with energy and mass. But you know that that's a conversation for another so, day. So you started with the sentence. I don't. I disagree with it because it didn't really replace it. But on screen for my audience right now, I've got that Scientific American article that gives the current science. Right, it's not proving something. It's just outlining what is the current science. So if you're going to disagree with me, which is cited by Scientific American for literally snapping the wand in two, 
by showing that the curvature of space-time and not an invisible force gives rise to gravi- gravitational attraction. I'm going to ask you if you've got any other evidence to support your dis- your your um, disagreement, because at this point, I'm asking you to prove that your disagreement's got substance or validity within science. Yeah. Now, you see how he sprung his trap? Early on in the interview, he asked the loaded question about theoretical physics. And then he tried to discount all mathematical models. Now he's saying that Einstein replaced Newton, and since Einstein is a theoretical mathematical model, we can safely discard it. Now, logic would say that if you discard Einsteinian gravity, we just go back to Newtonian gravity. But he's saying that Einstein replaced Newton, so therefore Newton's gone. And now we dismiss Einstein because it's mass. So now we have no concept whatsoever of gravity. Pretty neat trick, huh? Within science. Yes, 100%, because we still use those, the law of gravitational attraction to, uh, to, to figure things out. That equation hasn't been thrown away. It's still an accurate predictive um, equation, uh, a mathematical law that we can use to describe the actions of things around us. You are right, and I, I even agreed with you at the start that Newton assumed it was an invisible force. But yes, Einstein said, no, it's not an invisible force. It, it's the warping of space-time. Um, right, but one but, did but again, see the he, other. It still manifests within Newtonian physics that we understand as a force, because there's right. an acceleration. So my question is, right, okay, so that's going to lead on to two questions. You just said the word force, so I'm going to have two questions now. Do you have any current citation that's supported by science that allows you to use Newtonian principles instead of rel- instead of relativity by Einstein? It's like a yes or a no. Well, again, I wouldn't use one or the other. That, yeah, but that's... you're disagreeing with me that one shouldn't be used, and you're saying that you use them practically, mathematically, every day, and I'm saying, have you got anything that supports that that's current science? Well, yes, all, all the, the, the equations that we use to actually figure out attractive forces... That is still okay, Newtonian well, physics that we use. Yeah, but respectfully, you've not answered my question. You've, you've said yes, but I'm asking you to produce evidence that supports your assertion that current science allows you to use Newtonian principles instead of relativity by Einstein. Bear with me. There's a particular paper I was reading. Let me just get it for you. And while, just whilst you're looking up that... Uh, I just want to play a little clip in the background. I'll give you a minute or two to find it whilst I'm looking some up, uh, whilst I'm playing this. Easy to find. And as we skim through this, I'm going to point out a couple of key paragraphs. And there we have the limits of his research. He skimmed through the article and cherry-picked things that he thinks proves his point. I read the entire article, and the first thing to say to Lyle is that this article should not be used as proof of anything. It's not a scientific paper. Just because it's on Scientific American doesn't really mean anything. It's not a peer-reviewed, tested, and accepted proof of anything. It's an article, somebody's opinion. But I will break down what the article actually says. It's about the author's personal experience in understanding some of the things that Einstein said. It covers how Einstein figured out that gravity is not an invisible force, but the curvature of space-time that can change the locality of something, and how it relates to and expands upon Newton's understanding of gravity. Um, In short, It actually helps explain how Newtonian gravity is the what and Einsteinian gravity is the why. Yet, Newton didn't have a complete understanding. So that citation there is similar to what you've just said for which credit's been given. But what you didn't say is the key point that I made in my response video, which was that it snapped the wand in two by showing that curvature of space-time and not an invisible force gives rise to gravitational attraction. But my problem is that if you're going to say that, then... um, we need some science to support that position that as far as I can see, the current science is Newtonian it is Einsteinian. Um, and I'm assuming that you're going to come up with something and, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, but if you haven't got anything at this point, perhaps we can move on because I do want to talk about something that the ball has frequently talk about, which yeah. is the um, Cavendish experiment. I will. What value do you put to the Cavendish experiment um, in terms of weight of evidence? Well, can I ask you a question first? What, sure. what do you think the Cavendish experiment was for? To measure the density of the Earth. Well done. That's better than most flat earthers. Um, Thanks. I have it literally on screen. <laughs> um, obviously, mo- most people 
um, when you talk about the Cavendish experiment, just assume it was to figure out the, the, the G constant, but that was actually a byproduct of what he was doing. Um, the, the validity of the experiment, um, I think, is you know, very good because it follows the scientific method it has really? independent and dependent variables. It, ah, um, what, what, it, what, what's, what was the observed phenomena, though, in the Cavendish experiment? Attractive force. Okay. So how was that demonstrated in the experiment? Because you could see that the weights moved towards each other when there was no other interaction. Okay. I, I agree. That is what he's, he's demonstrated. Would you agree or disagree with me when... I state that there are uh, there are videos on YouTube like that go both ways. There are videos that basically some people say that you can do it, other people say that you cannot do it, um, and it's difficult to repeat. Would you agree with that? I would agree that it's difficult to repeat, and and this is why when when Cavendish originally did his experiment, he he did it over a year, um, I think even more than a year, um, and you know he took as many precautions as, as he could to try and you know um, limit any external influences on the apparatus and etc you know he built a, a big box in his shed uh, and he used telescopes to measure the angles obviously he didn't have lasers and stuff at the time so the best way to look at the minute changes was to use a telescope and and you know, view it from the outside sure so i've in the skype chat i've sent you the link for the video that i'm just about to play for my audience of four minutes and 12 so go from four minutes 10 seconds onwards you get the professor that's describing how his technician has basically sawed this apparatus in half. And I'm going to read what he says. Um, I'll get it on screen so that I can present it as well as... Um, uh, bear with me. There's another thing. He said, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play it from four minutes ten. You might want to click the link and listen to it yourself if you'd, if you'd like. That might be helpful for I us both. I think I can, if you play it, I'll be able to hear it now. All right, okay. Now Anthony is going to try and cast doubt upon the Cavendish experiment. He's going to say that it is extremely difficult to do and it can be frustrating at times. And that's very true. Does that mean that it can't be done? No. Does that mean it hasn't been done tens of thousands of times by colleges on an annual basis? No. You can buy a kit to do this for about 800 bucks. An analogy of this would be me saying that changing my brakes is kind of hard because it's not something that I'm very good at. So therefore, it can't be done. It, it just doesn't work that way. So he says that the experiment is really very difficult to get to work, right? He doesn't mm -hmm. say the experiment's very difficult to, to demonstrate. He says it's very difficult to get to work. Now, that might just be a Freudian slip. Um, but if it's very difficult to get to work for a technician that gets that pissed off with it, he saws it in half, what's the likelihood that the average um, viewer for YouTube that's trying to work out the truth is what's the likelihood that they should accept people like Sly Sparkane or Miles Delia Davis Miles Davis, when they repeated it in their bedroom, when a university professor had to saw it in half because he was that frustrated with it because he, quote, couldn't get it to work. Now, here's the problem with this analogy that he's making. He's saying that the experiment is so difficult that somebody just destroyed it out of frustration. And that may be. I'm sure they lost their job over it because it's an expensive piece of equipment. However, it could have simply broken. They could have taken it apart to try and see what broke and maybe suggest a way of making it better. Most likely explanation is that it was a piece of laboratory equipment that broke and it was taken apart as a demonstration for other students. Even though all three situations are speculation on my part, the idea that Anthony is trying to put forth here that this is such an unreliable experiment, it was just frustrating to try and get it to work the way the books say that it should work is very, very unlikely. Well, it, it is a very fiddly thing. And I mean, uh, the, the clip that you showed, the, the, the experiments contained within like a plastic um, container. Uh, and that, I think that particular one was a very small scale version of the Cavendish experiment. And that's going to come with its own problems. Yes, there is going to be issues with people trying to do this in their bedroom you're not going to be able to get the same you know laboratory conditions etc um the, the, so the, the so best if, one that if, i've seen at the moment of people trying to do it themselves is a guy called bm Furball pancake hero uh who is trying to take as many precautions as possible to remove any static attraction and any uh perturbations from air and everything um it's not 
an experiment that just everyone can set up because it's not that easy to do. You're right. So if Dell in his shed was to do the Cavendish experiment in his shed, he's kind of repeating what Cavendish did, right? It Would you could accept? Be attempting it? to, yes. Yeah, I mean, do you think that a bloke in his shed or some university professors that have got actual equipment that's specifically designed to do the job that gets sawed in half because um, he found it very difficult to get it to work? Do you think they either seem credible in terms of making the point that this is repeatable? Because my my position is that whilst you can go and find videos that do support it, you can find an equal amount that don't support it. And given how complicated it is to, supposedly to get it to work, um, the question becomes how remote is it that this point is actually valid? So leading on from that, that's a, that's a, um, a rhetorical. My, my question that follows that is um, the value of gravity that's attributed in the Cavendish experiment. Are you familiar with what value that actually was according to his paper? As in what he figured out G to be? The, the, the force between the balls. When he was measuring this so-called movement between the balls that he was attributing to gravity, do you know what um, how he quantified it in his paper? Um, I do. I, bear with me. I've got it written down. Sorry. Go on. Just, just explain. I... I'm reading from his paper. Um, I'll give you a, a, a copy of the link and I'll, I'll drop it in the... Uh, Skype chat just for you. Hang on. I'm reading from his paper, which is um, it's it's the one that went to the Royal Society. It is a copy of his original paper. It's dated June the 21st, 1798. Now, this is really contentious because a lot of ballers say that I don't understand this, but I'm going to put it to you that I completely understand this, and I'm going to ask you to explain how I've either got it wrong or explain how it's explained. Um, but at the bottom of page two of his actual paper, it reads, quote, as the force with which the balls are attracted by these weights is excessively minute, uh -huh, yes, right? Yes. The force with which the balls are attracted by the weights. So he's on about the lateral force between the weights. It's excessively minute. It's not more than a 50 millionth of their weight. It's okay. Of the four primary forces in nature, gravity is by far the weakest. What Riley is making a point here of is something called a fallacy of personal incredulity. Since the attraction between the balls is no more than 1 in 50 million, that somehow makes it false. Well, I find it personally incredulous that airplanes can travel 600 miles an hour. So, therefore, they can't, right? The bottom line is that saying something is excessively small or excessively large does not make it false. That is simply a logical fallacy and an invalid argument. It's plain that a very minute disturbing force will be sufficient to destroy the success of the experiment. So he has to take follow he has to take precautions and stuff. Yeah. But my question is, if he describes it as excessively minute and it's fifty million to one as a ratio, either can you tell me how I've misunderstood that? Or can you tell me what was actually meant by that? Because I will assert that the force between the balls, as it right as it says, is not more than a fifty millionth to one. Yeah, well <clears throat> it, it it's not saying um, that there's like a one in 50 millionth chance, obviously. What really? I'm saying is that the attractive force compared to the masses is very, very minute. No, and that's that, not what it says. That, no, 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 that's not what it says. Let me read it again. I'll read it verbatim. It says, as the force with which the balls are attracted by these weights is excessively minute. It's not talking about the mass. It's talking about the force with which the balls are attracted by the weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's not, as yeah, the force it, with which the balls are attracted by these weights is excessively minute, not more than one fifty millionth of their weight. It is plain that a very minute disturbing force, yes. So the force, but obviously, you know, force is mass times acceleration, so we can still talk about mass because that's what force is. So, yes, the, the, the force no, compared sorry, to I'm, the, you know, what... I'm what, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just, I don't mean to be rude, but I need to interrupt you there. Just give me the definition of force again. It's mass times acceleration. Right, that's a mathematical definition, though, right? Well, yeah, but it's a demonstrable fact that that's how you calculate force. No, that's how you calculate force. Yeah. Yeah, but how do you demonstrate force? I've got a definition on screen. It's a push or a pull upon an object resulting from the object's interaction with another object. Okay, I don't, but there has I don't to disagree be a push. with that. But there has to be a push or a pull. If, if I can just explain why, um, why the Cavendish experiment... It, what what it did the the it the sorry the experiment was set up to exacerbate the gravitational attraction to to amplify it to make it easier to measure 
So okay. when when it so, says that the the force between them is, is not more than one hundred and fifty millionth of their weight, um, that is absolutely correct, and that's why it has to be done in such conditions that nothing can disrupt it. Um, and this so is the, why that Cavendish did the experiment over a year, taking multiple readings to make sure that you know what he was getting wasn't just results from disturbances and things. Um, so you, you are right that it is a very, very minute force compared to their weight. Um, and and right. again, when you look at weight, that's you know, mass times gravity. Well, thank you for confirming that because all the bowlers tell me that I get that wrong. Now, it's well, clear that I'm I, not I getting think it wrong. In, uh, in the video that you originally did about it, you, you described it as um, a, a chance rather than a ratio. You, you actually described it as a one in 50 millionth chance of it being... Yeah, like a probability. But yeah. did you see the, the asterisk that followed it? It said that um, although it's not a probability, it's effectively the same thing in this context. I did distinguish it from a, a probability, but I, I agree with you. I did describe it that way. You're right. Yeah. So, there was uh, I mean, I won't disagree with you. The fact that it is a hard thing to do and it is such a minute you know, thing that you need to measure. And, but that's why the experiment was designed in such a way, um, you know, using the torsion coefficient of the wire and everything to be able to calculate such a minute force. The whole thing All right. was set up to you know, make it amplify so that you're actually able to measure it but at the same right, time so that would come with its own problems because if you're amplifying the force you would also be amplifying any outside influences so I, I agree with you that it can be a very very difficult thing to do and to do correctly but when it is done correctly all the measurements come out the same you get the, right. the, the value of, of g being what we know it to be and it's always the same well, it is the thing. I'll give you Cavendish, right? You can make whatever assertion about it that you want. When we go that was actually a very important statement. I will give you Cavendish. You can make any assertion about it you want. With that one statement, Riley acknowledges gravity, attraction of mass to mass, the density of the Earth, and the weight of the Earth. Now, Riley may have meant this as a hand wave. Well, okay, you can have that derpa, derpa, derpa. But here is where Craig should have hammered him on that because he's admitting all of that. This is a classic Anthony tactic to simply hand wave something off. Well, you can have that. It's not important. Well, yes, it is. It's very important. And what we need to do when he does this is start calling him on it. Now, one thing we probably won't be getting to because this is getting to be a long video is that later on in this same interview, and I'll put the link up for it, Anthony Riley acknowledges the moon landings. If you acknowledge the moon landings, you acknowledge a number of things. First, rockets work in space because we have been there to get to the moon. If we have been to the moon, we have pictures of the Earth looking back. If we have been to the moon, satellites, by definition, are what they say they are. The entire flat earth concept that we don't know what the moon is goes out the window if we have been there. The entire flat earth concept that we don't know how far the moon is from us goes out the window because we've made the trip. When we go back to the current science, it literally says the words, and I'll quote it again, general relativity snapped the wand in two by showing that the curvature of space-time and not an invisible force gives rise to gravitational attraction. So I'll give you that your invisible force that, that Newton predicted or, or talked about, um, I'll give you that the Cavendish experiment demonstrates or shows that. However, current science doesn't maintain that that's the current position. It says that it, it, it's no longer, it specifically expressly uh, denounces it, not an invisible force gives rise to gravitational attraction. Now, I want to point out the inconsistency internally of this argument now. What Anthony is saying is that Cavendish demonstrated Newtonian gravity and attraction between the masses, but because we have somehow changed our definition of what gravity is, he's asserting that that force which was measured is no longer valid and therefore doesn't exist. This, combined with his $64 phrase, demonstrates his complete lack of comprehension of the entire concept 
of a attractive force acting between masses. And the interaction between the force that he admits is measured and the cause of that force. Now, before Anthony has a chance to jump on that statement, gravity, according to Einstein, is a distortion of space-time by mass. It is measurable by the Newtonian force of gravity. Again, the problem with that is we're back to the maths that makes it theoretical physics. And by sheer coincidence, we've got a scientific American document, which I'll give you a copy of uh, in, the, in your Skype from right now. Hang on. Which basically says that theoretical physics is pointless. And by coincidence, the article happens to have a picture of Einstein in it talking about relativity. If anybody's not seen this in the chat, go and have a look at it because it talks about string theory that also came up. But my, my point goes back to this. You can have Cavendish, right? You can make you can claim that it proves whatever you want. If Cavendish has been superseded by phys- uh, by uh, Einstein with relativity, and Einstein puts a mathematical concept, which we know by definition is conceptual, um, we know it's a reification fallacy if you treat it as though it's real world, what value does it have when it's not capable of experimental application because it's maths? Again, I disagree that you cannot use the two together. So you you're disagree. right. Um, I, if you want the, the way that you describe it, it snapped the wand in two to say it's not an invisible force. And I started with agreeing with you with that. You know, that's how Newton saw it because that was how he could measure the acceleration, and acceleration requires a force. But Einstein explained that it, it was not an invisible force; it was the warping of space time. But that right, doesn't, so I, that, so, but that doesn't so, mean that um, you can't measure it as a force. Because within Newtonian physics, yeah, of course it manifests it does. as an of attractive it, force. Of course it does. You can't measure it as a force if it's mathematical by nature. Well, you Listen, can still, I, I, you can still measure I, the force, Anthony. You can still measure that there's a downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. You can still measure the attractive force between any two objects in the universe using Newton's law of gravitational attraction. That's not something that can just be thrown away. It's a mathematical law that has been proven time and time again to be fact. Now, we need to actually say something about Einstein. It was verified experimentally by Eddington at the 1919 solar eclipse. Einstein's equations predicted that light from distant stars would be warped around a large mass like the sun. During the solar eclipse, they took star maps that were carefully mapped, and then when the sun was between the stars and the earth during the eclipse, they measured the locations of the stars. The star locations were changed exactly as Einstein predicted. This experimentally confirmed the theoretical physics of Einstein's general relativity. Now, a word on this as an experiment. The investigator, Eddington, did not physically move the sun between the stars and the Earth. He allowed nature to put the sun there. That is the independent variable. The dependent variable in this experiment was the locations or the apparent locations of the stars. Under Riley's very narrow interpretation of the scientific method, he would say that this is not science because Eddington didn't physically move the sun himself. He allowed nature to do it for him. This is ludicrous. But you can't calculate, you can't measure a force when you can't demonstrate that there's an interaction between the two objects. Because this is where it starts getting a little bit scientific method, right? Um, You're obviously familiar with the scientific method, right? Yes, very Um, much so. Do you agree that you've got to manipulate your independent variable to prove that that it is the cause of the effect that you believe that you're witnessing? Um, Yeah, and and that's what the Cavendish did. So the independent variable Mm. in the the Cavendish was... The, the distance between the weights. All right, so, so distance you between manipulate the weights, the, the, weights the, the distance between the weights, and that manipulates the gravitational attraction between the weights. Do we agree that when you manipulate the, your independent variable, that is your presumed cause? So if you're going to vary the distance between the weights, that would be your cause. But if you're trying to prove gravity, which he wasn't, he was trying to measure the density of the Earth. But if you're going to use it to say that he was trying to prove gravity, he has to manipulate gravity as his independent variable. Correct? He is manipulating gravity. Well, he's manipulating the gravitational attraction because the inverse square law 
you know, the closer something is, the 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 stronger the gravitational attraction is going to be. So right. he's by, mani he's... by manipulating the distance between the weights, you literally are manipulating the the gravitational attraction between the objects. No, you're not. You are inferring that there is a, a cause there, but you're not manipulating the cause. You're correlating the effect that you believe you're witnessing, and you're correlating that with what you presume is your your wiggling. And I'll give you an example. Every morning the sun rises at whatever time. Ten minutes before the sun rises, a rooster crows every morning, right? And every morning you notice that there seems to be a pattern that the rooster crows just before sunrise and then the sun rises. And you think in your head that that, that correlation that you're witnessing is actually the cause. And you think that the rooster is actually causing the sun rising because every single morning without fail the sun rises just after the rooster crows. But then the rooster dies and then the, st the, 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 the sun still comes up. So what you've witnessed is a correlation that you think is causing the sun rising, but it isn't actually doing it real world. So your claim of moving the, the weights to and from or closer and further away is a correlation because you're not manipulating the actual cause, which in this experiment wasn't even gravity. But it, let's just say it was. If you're going to prove gravity is a thing, you have to manipulate your independent variable being gravity, not the correlation, not the interaction or proximity. You've got to wiggle that gravity to prove that it is the cause of the effect that you believe that you're seeing. And there you have his argument. If you cannot physically manipulate gravity of an object, you cannot test for gravity. If you cannot test for gravity, you cannot measure gravity. And by the way, Craig is correct. This is a experiment to determine the force of attraction between masses, which is directly related to the square of the distance between them. That had already been determined by Newton's and others as a proportionate relationship. Cavendish was attempting to quantify that relationship, enabling him to measure the weight of the Earth, and by knowing the weight and the size of the Earth, determine its density. Do you disagree? And again, you are manipulating the gravitational attraction by changing the weight. The closer something is, the, the, the stronger that force is going to be, the, 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 you know, the more uh, uh, acceleration towards the object there's going to be. You are manipulating the cause. You are You're not. You are trying You're to... Not. Be, because you can have the, the, the weights at different distances between them, and that will give you a different gravitational attraction based on how far away they are. But you'd always get the same for G because it's based on the, the distance between the centers. Well, we're 52 minutes into this right now and still have more than an hour of this debate left. I think that's enough for one trip. Anthony is about to go into his alternative explanation of gravity, which is density and buoyancy. And he and Craig are going to go back and forth about that for another hour. If you would like me to cover that aspect of the debate with my commentary, leave me a comment in this video. In the meantime, let's have a look at the actual universal law of gravity as determined by Newton. Force equals the gravitational constant times mass 1 times mass 2 over the radius square. Now the fact that the force of attraction was proportionate to the product of the masses over the radius squared was already known before Cavendish came on the scene. His was a method designed to put a quantitative value on the amount of force. Once that was known, he could calculate the weight of the Earth. 75 years after his experiment, this conversion factor or constant became known as g. And while many people are under the impression that Cavendish established the value of g, he actually only did it indirectly, and it was later derived by others. I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching this video with me. The point of the video is not just that Flat Earth and people like Anthony Riley don't understand these concepts. I think they do understand some of them but it's the techniques that they use to try and work around them to support their own narratives that I find interesting, and I hope you did too. I think doing examinations of debates like this is very helpful in dealing with these situations in the future, because at least we know what we're up against and the techniques that they're going to do. It's kind of like watching game films prior to the big game. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Marquette, Michigan. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel and take care. The